So, I define myself as a person who is guided by love. I choose love over hate and hope over despair. When it's raining, I'm the first to see the rainbow. And flying over turbulence, well, I've been known to lean over to my neighbor and whisper, hey, don't worry, turbulence is our friend. It pushes the plane up, you see? And while bombs were being dropped on Lebanon, I was blogging about life and not death. But I'm getting tired, I have to tell you. I've been trying so hard not to become that Arab woman the media loves to portray on television. You know the one, you've seen her before. She's on her knees, screaming up to God because someone she loves has just been killed. In over four decades, the news coming out of the Middle East hasn't really changed much. But I am not ready to give up, not yet. You see, I live in Beirut, Lebanon. Life there is so uncertain that we tend to live each day as if there were no tomorrow. Everything is so intense. We work like there's no tomorrow. We drive, we argue, we drink and dance, and even make love as if it were our last day on Earth. Beirut is a complex and beautiful city. When you're constantly courting death, you learn how to appreciate life. You learn how to improvise dinners over candlelight, well, because the electricity has just been cut off again. You grow jasmine and gardenias to cover up the bullet holes on your buildings. In his village in the mountains, my grandfather planted trees everywhere a bomb exploded. So we've become naturally creative because no day is ever like the previous one. But on the downside, uh, we've become very immune to even the possibility of stability. That we've stopped planning for the future. And that scares me. Well, how can you? When all you hear are politicians going on, going on about things like transitional governments, sanctions, violation, condemnation, escalation, invasions, incursions, and even preemptive military strikes. They basically condemn our future before we've even had a chance to create a different one and possibly prove them wrong. Since when did bombs lead to peace and stability? Since when? Today, I propose an alternative, a word that's missing from our current vocabulary of negotiations. Um, that word is love. The equation is simple. If violence begets violence, what could love do? Love is the only approach we haven't tried yet. And I learned this, as I'm sure many of us do, the hard way. On September 11, 2001, I was standing in the middle of 6th Avenue in New York City. And as I watched the first building fall, the first tower, I knew life would never be the same again. 
I understood that day that war had become a global epidemic. It was very difficult being an Arab in New York after that. A few years later, I decided it was time to go back home to Beirut. The civil war had been over for many years, so it seemed like a perfectly good idea at the time. However, what I was about to experience, nothing could prepare me for. Assassinations, car bombs, and a full-scale invasion by the Israeli army in 2006. The first night, the bomb started to fall. I ran to my computer and started blogging. If I was going to die that night, I wanted to make sure the whole world knew how and why. I didn't want to be another nameless victim. And to make matters worse, my best friend in the whole wide world, my soulmate, Maya, had just been diagnosed with cancer. We literally found ourselves dodging bombs, trying to get to the hospital for her chemotherapy. I wrote every day, just like Shahrazad, believing that sharing our stories would keep us alive. I remember putting back a tin of milk at the supermarket, thinking it would be of more value to a mother. Um, instead, Maya suggested we buy a bottle of triple sec to make cosmopolitans. She was the Sex in the City fan. I was also blogging about how the Israeli army blew up our fuel reserves. 15,000 tons of oil spilled into our beautiful Mediterranean. It was the largest environmental disaster of the Eastern Mediterranean. I wrote with love in my heart because I truly believed that if I could make a connection to my readers, then maybe they could do something to help put an end to the invasion. I had no idea then how important blogging was to become for the Arab world. And the day the war ended, I was absolutely sure that Maya and I were going to grow old together. But I was wrong. War is cancer, and cancer is war. And Maya never had a chance for a fair fight. We lost her, and then I lost myself. I had been writing so optimistically during the war, but now I was doing everything I was asking people not to do, feeling anger, hate, wanting to blame, wanting revenge. I became that woman on television. When does the media decide that they've had enough of the topic? When we start burying our dead, that's when. No one ever wants to know how many of us really died. Maya and I had been big fans of the movie Airplane, you know, the Hollywood comedy. We knew every line and every scene by heart, and running around the streets of Beirut, we'd shout out to each other, hey, Surely you must be joking. I'm not, and stop calling me Shirley. <laughs> we never really quite fit in, but we had each other, and that was all that mattered. That was absolutely all that mattered. The day Maya passed away, I came home from the hospital cried in my mother's lap for hours and hours and hours. And after a while, um, she suggested we turn on the TV for a little distraction. Yeah, sure, why not? 
We turned it on, and there it was on Lebanese television, airplane. <laughs> It was the scene towards the end of the film when all seems lost and the plane's about to crash and Elaine turns around to Ted Stryker and says, I just wanted you to know now I'm really proud. I wasn't ready to get the message that night, um, but after a while, I learned that the dead only want the best for us. After a few years, I finally stopped victimizing myself and learned that pain can be transformed into positivity, loss into life. Love, love is the most powerful tool we have. Love is what will change the world. Love is what will transform the Middle East. Nothing else has worked so far. All we have left, after all the destruction, all we have left is love. So, I have to tell you, it's really the only way that walls will fall and bombs and bullets will cease to exist. And today in my artwork, I explore issues of violence, gender, and religion. For example, um, this is a giant disco ball I've built. It's four meters by four meters, and it says the word Allah. God. Music accompanies this and it invites you to dance rather than kill under the light of God. Disco, of course, is preferable. I've only shown this piece in Europe and once even inside a church in Italy, but my dream is to take it home. What if, what if we could take it to Jerusalem. Um, another project, uh, this is a dress I wear every year and uh, run around the streets of Beirut in. I call her the Pink Bride of Peace. I've passed out flowers to hundreds of people and run across cities all throughout Lebanon, all in the name of love. What if we were all pink brides of peace? <laughs> what if we stormed our government buildings demanding they write love into our constitutions? Wouldn't it be cool if tolerance and reconciliation were classes, mandatory classes we took in high school? So, when you look at my artwork today, it's very easy to assume certain things when you see all the glitter and beads. But I found that in order to write or paint about violence, I've had to create my own language. Uh, one that plays with humor and irony. I basically take an object of violence and transform it into a celebration of life through pink, creating something beautiful. I want my work to be accessible because peace should be completely accessible. I don't use glue in my work. I use tiny pins, thousands of them. In a way, it reflects the instability of my region. At any point in time, you could rearrange the paintings to tell a completely different story. Well, as for glitter, glitter reflects light. And the more color and glitter I use, the closer I am to light, to the source. The pink objects and embellishments are my weapons of positive energy. 
I take aim and shoot them into the heart of fear, negating the negative. An ongoing body of work is called Goods for Gaza. The Israeli army has a list of items that are banned from Gaza. In 2010, after some activists died on board the Mavi Marmara while trying to sail in some much needed aid and supplies, I did a simple online research and found the list. It contains about 2,000 items, which includes some of the following. Desks, donkeys, A4 paper, chocolate, biscuits, goats, ginger, cardamom. I've been making a mixed media painting for each word and will continue to do so until the blockade is lifted. Palestinian children should have the right to eat chocolate. I am 36 years old today, and I would love to have a daughter one day. I would love to share the world with her. I would love to watch her fall in love for the first time. I would like to name her Maya Rose. But today, this all seems so far away. Why has it become so hard for us to talk about love, to say the word love? We all know it's a great idea, but it seems a little bit impossible sometimes. So, how do we get there? First, forgiveness. We have to forgive each other. I'm talking about world amnesty, forgiveness for everything we've ever done wrong to each other. Second, responsibility. We have to take responsibility in creating a healthy global economy. One that invests in a positive and peaceful future. Unlike the one we have now, which is based on wars and the sales of weapons to control resources. And third, our favorite word coming out of the Arab world today, revolution. We need to empower a revolution that will transform the human spirit. One that extends way beyond Tahrir Square and Wall Street. A revolution based on love, tolerance, and respect that is deeply rooted in our daily actions and the choices we make and extends to our shared and connected communities. If violence begets violence, love will surely bring love. Just don't call me Shirley. Thank you.